Hi everyone, welcome to this week's Azure Update. It's the 28th of November. If you're in the States, I hope you had an awesome Thanksgiving. As always, we have the chapters, so you can jump to any particular update you care about the most. And this t-shirt, uh, you can get it in my t-shirt store. It's in the link in the description of the video. People generally ask, where'd you get your t-shirt? All the money does go to cure childhood cancer, so really good cause as always. New videos this week, and actually a change to new videos my channel now has the automatic dubbing enabled to a lot more languages. Before it was just like two other languages, but now my new videos should be in a lot more languages. So hopefully that helps um, for more of the non-English speaking. But new videos, obviously last week was the Ignite special. That was like an hour long, went through most of the big Ignite announcements. Now I did a, a top 10 features for SQL Server 2025. Some of those are already in Azure because Azure is evergreen, some of the services. Some of them will now start appearing in things like Azure SQL MI. But there's some really nice capabilities, so did a quick video all about it. So on to what's new on the compute side. So Azure Functions Flexible now has a custom handler. So Azure Functions is serverless. There's some event that triggers the code, the pro code that I write in a large number of languages. And there are a lot of those native language specific handlers, but there may be a time where I want to use Azure Functions, but I need to write in a language that isn't supported as part of those native language specific handlers. Maybe I'm using Go, maybe I'm using Rust, maybe it's un an unsupported runtime. So custom handlers are basically a very lightweight web server that you write that will receive an event from the Azure Function host process. So the host process still gets triggered by that event. And then I can write that little web server thing you're writing in any code you want, as long as it sports HTTP primitives. So I write code that will receive the request from the function host and then send the response payload back to the functions host. So it gives you a lot of flexibility. So, hey, that ability to write your own custom handler is now GA. Azure Bastion now supports a browser-based Entra ID integrated RDP connection. So if I was authenticating from the native client, I could already use Entra ID integrated all for SSH and RDP. From the portal, from a browser, I could use SSH only. So with this update, I can now use RDP as well via the browser. And obviously the great thing about Entra ID integrated authentication it gives me a better security stance compared to local authentication, and it gives me a much more seamless user experience. Now, you will need the AAD login for Windows extension enabled in that VM. And then obviously I would need either the virtual machine user login or the virtual machine administrator login role on it. But now, hey, I'm using the browser. I can use that entry integrated authentication when I'm RDPing into a Bastion enabled target. On the networking side, so Network Watcher and a number of its components now has managed identity support in preview. So we're thinking about VNet flow logs, traffic analytics, packet capture. Well, remember those things all go and write data somewhere. They write to blob storage or they write to log analytics workspaces. And that technology has to be able to authenticate to that blob storage or the log analytics workspace. So with using managed identities, I don't have to try and store a secret or a shared access signature or anything else. It's just a native identity that's part of that network watcher that can now be given permission at the data plane level to the blob storage, to the log analytics workspace. So I remove the need to have to manage any kind of credential. On the storage side, so Azure File Sync is now available in New Zealand North. Remember Azure File Sync is about that synchronization and tiering ability from many Windows-based SMB servers to a single cloud endpoint, an Azure File Share. So the Azure File Sync service is that orchestration component. And then I can also tier content off from those Windows file servers if they reach a certain capacity. So now being able to do that in New Zealand North means if my servers are in that location, it'll be a lower latency when I'm synchronizing uh, via it. Database side, so this is actually one of the features in SQL Server 2025, but now Azure SQL Database has regex support in T-SQL as GA. So regex, remember, these regular expressions have crazy capabilities for doing these weird string matching combinations and then replacements. 
well, I can now natively use it directly in Azure SQL database and SQL Server 2025. So the number of new functions like regexp like to look for a match against the regex pattern, regex replace to return a modified string based on a regex pattern. So I don't have to go and bounce out to some external compute processing now. I can do it all within uh, my T-SQL engine. Um, the Azure MCP server now supports MySQL. So remember, the whole big deal about MCP servers is it enables an AI app to get access to additional knowledge, additional tooling, and I don't have to explain how the MCP server reflects its capabilities in a manner the AI app can understand. So we have the Azure MCP server to expose many Azure capabilities. Well, now those capabilities include Azure database for MySQL. So my AI app that is using the Azure MCP server can now get schema information about my uh, MySQL instance. It can query across data and a lot more other things without me having to go and write particular code myself. On the miscellaneous, so the Azure Machine Learning Low Priority VM capability is being retired uh, end of March. So this would let you basically take advantage of Azure's unused capacity at a cheaper price, but you could get kicked off just like spot instances. So you would need to handle interruptions. Basically, you need to move the cluster to dedicated VMs before that time, or it's just going to stop working. Azure load testing is available in, in Italy North. So load testing is now part of that Azure app testing set of capabilities. And we use the load testing part to perform high scale load and simulation testing against our workloads, all on managed infrastructure. Now, I can use a GUI to create those tests, or I can bring my own JMeter or local scripts. But hey, now I can use it in a new region. And API management and API center now has that model context protocol support in GA, which makes a huge amount of sense. If you think about what they do, I think of APIM for that runtime integration and talking to my APIs. API Center is about that development time, discovering and cataloging and working out what's available. So with the APIM support, I can now put APIM in front of my MCP servers and it would provide the authentication, the authorization, um, rate control limiting, so a whole bunch more to help protect them. And it can even turn regular APIs that I'm exposing via APIM into MCP servers. API Center can now act as a private registry for your MCP service, helps them be discovered, um, just helps that in your organization. And then at Ignite, there was a whole bunch of announcements about the Anthropic Cloud models. Well, the Cloud Opus 4.5 is now available in preview in Foundry. Today, it's only as the global standard deployment type. But Opus 4.5 is really good for coding, refactoring of code, agents, computer use, deep research, and a whole bunch of other stuff. So yes, I can use it in the Foundry Playground and Foundry and GitHub Copilot and Microsoft Copilot Studio as well. And that was it. Um, quick update. Everyone's busy doing Thanksgiving stuff. So in the next update, take care.